Prologue Rock Bottom Those two words had been bouncing around Smithy's head all day. This had to be rock bottom. It could take many forms for many people. He'd once known an alcoholic who had woken up naked in a kiddie's ball pit. That had been the moment that had pushed him to finally get help, and the one that had cost him his job as a school vice principal. The comedian Richard Pryor famously set himself on fire while freebasing cocaine and missed the once-in-a-lifetime chance to work with the Muppets. So Rock Bottom was different for everybody. Smithy wasn't naked, high or on fire. He was in full possession of his faculties, hiding in some bushes, and dressed as a leprechaun. He was also, he now realised with absolute clarity, a gambling addict. It wasn't as if he hadn't known that before, but there was knowing, and there was knowing. Lying face down in the mud to avoid getting shot offered an excellent opportunity for a personal audit. The results were not pretty. Three weeks ago, Jimmy Trike, who described himself as a casting agent, but was really so much less, had approached him about a job. Five grand. For an acting gig, that was a lot. For one day's work, that was an awful lot. For an actor who'd not had a paid acting job for two years, four months, and twelve days, that was one hell of an awful lot. On top of that, Jimmy mentioned it was five grand guaranteed, with a chance of it increasing to fifty. Smithy had been around far too long not to smell a massive rat. It hadn't been an acting role at all. It turned out Jimmy Trike was who you went to if you were organising a leprechaun hunt, and you needed prey. He hadn't phrased it quite like that, but Smithy had figured it out. Being a dwarf actor, he'd been offered a lot of leprechaun work in the past and had always turned it down, regardless of how much he needed the money, because it played into the bullshit narrative that the only parts people like him could play were inextricably linked to their height, as if the gamut of human emotion could only be run by somebody over six feet tall. You want someone who can embody the human experience? How about someone who has to put up with a world designed for people two feet taller than them, and who has to suffer the indignity of people treating them like a novelty item? Smithy had turned down the job, but only after getting into it with Jimmy. Shame on him, for making people into some kind of humiliating sideshow for the gratification of Wall Street jerk-offs with the emotional maturity of prepubescent boys. He had been forthright, incisive, and eloquent. He'd also managed to keep his temper in check. Smithy had a bit of an anger management issue. At least, that was what the judge had called it. Smithy's girlfriend, Cheryl, had looked visibly relieved to hear that while he had given the scumbag a large piece of his mind, he hadn't garnished it with any physical violence. He had neglected to mention that he may have had a run-in with Jimmy's dumbass jeep in the parking lot afterwards. Who needs a jeep in Manhattan, for Christ's sake? The whole thing had felt righteous. Then, a couple of weeks later, Smithy had felt way too confident about a full house of kings over sevens, and he'd found himself in five grand to Benny Wong. Worse, he hadn't cleared a line of credit beforehand assuring everyone he was good for it as he'd bet the pot. Benny didn't take kindly to such behaviour. You didn't run illegal card games in Chinatown for as long as he had, without having some very strict rules, and without having people working for him who could see to it that those rules were respected, on pain of pain. Five grand bought a lot of pain, or possibly the end of all pain. There had been rumours. Benny Wong knew a lot of people, and some of those people had occasionally ceased being people. 